my name's Chris. I'm about to do what's called the Heritage Tour. And before I get to talking about our history and heritage, I'd just like to get an idea where people are from. Can you just wave to me if you're from the other side? People are from the other colonies on that side of the country. Oh. <laughs> okay. If you're from Britain, fantastic. And if you're from somewhere else, tell me. Canada. Ireland, okay. Yeah, and Canada? United States. US, what part? Uh, California. Good, I'll put you in the store. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, what we're going to be doing is talking a little bit about Western Australian history. The part that you're in at the moment is called Noongar Territory because the Noongar Aboriginals were the first ones to come here and settle this part of the world. Then we had the first European, who was the Dutch. They didn't get a very good impression of this place because they came down and they went to Rodnest Island. Anyone going to Rodnest? It's a pretty big tourist place. Over there they've got little marsupials called quokkas. Beautiful little creatures. Unfortunately, the Dutch thought they were rats. And so they sent a message back to Europe that this was a terrible place full of rats. <laughs> On the other side of the country, the British came and they decided to dump all their criminals over there and start off penal colonies. After a while, some of those criminals finish their punishment, the guards finish their punishment of their job, and they stayed on as free settlers. Then California came along and had a gold rush. And a lot of them shot through to California to make their fortunes, and they found out how to find gold. They came back to New South Wales, and they realized a lot of the countryside was very similar, and so we had gold rushes in New South Wales, and then in Victoria. In the meantime, the British got a little bit concerned because there was a rumour going around that the French were thinking of coming to this side of Australia. And so they sent Captain Stirling over from New South Wales. He sailed down the Swan River and thought the Dutch were a little bit crazy because he thought this place was a beautiful part of the world. And so he set up a little farming community called the Swan River Settlement. People coming back from California caused the gold rushes on the other side of the country, which raised the number of free settlers in Australia. And then about the 1890s, they found most of the easy gold. And so the gold rushes slowed down and people started thinking, I wonder if there's gold over in the West. And those two blokes over there, depicted by the statue, Arthur Bailey and William Ford, they came over from the Victorian goldfields, but it was the days of horse and cart. And so they were coming overland and they stopped 600 kilometres short of Perth in the middle of the West Australian desert to look for gold. Now all the other gold rushes up until then, they were looking for what's called alluvial gold, gold that moves in water in places where there were still rivers. And so I'm sure you've seen movies where they go down and pan for the gold in the river, they find it in the area, and then later on they mine. When they got out there, in the middle of the West Australian desert, you're lucky if you can find a glass of water. And so Arthur Bailey and William Ford had to think of another way of finding gold. And so they went out and employed some of the local Aboriginal people to help them find ancient riverbeds that had dried up thousands of years ago as a result of climate change. And they're out there working in 48, 50 degree heat, physically scraping the surface of these ancient riverbeds, hoping to expose nuggets that had been dropped there thousands of years ago. Unfortunately, they weren't doing very well. And they stopped one night at a place called Fly's Flats. And that did it for them. We've had enough of this, we're going back to Victoria. But fortunately for the mining industry here, that night, a fairly unusual thing happened out there. They had a big storm. 
And as a result of that storm, Arthur and William were washed away down the riverbed in a flash flood. And when they got up to collect their equipment, they looked down in the riverbed. And what do you think they saw? Gold nuggets. And they're running around collecting up a few little nuggets. And they found one that was 16 kilos. And of course, they made quite a bit of noise about that. The news went back to the United Kingdom but also to China. And so we had thousands of British and Chinese land in Fremantle in sailing ships and thousands of those other ciders streaming across the desert. So much so, our population went from 40,000 to 160,000 in only two years. A massive boom here. And so Sir John Forrest, our first political leader, he pressured the British government to open up a branch of the Royal Mint of London in Perth, this building, to take the gold from the gold fields and manufacture it into gold sovereigns and half sovereigns. It's during those times Britain was on what's called a gold standard. If you took your pound note into any bank in the United Kingdom or in Australia, handed it over, they had to give you a gold sovereign for it, a coin with exactly a pound's worth of gold in it. And so that gave the British government a very stable currency, a big advantage in international trade. Then the British Empire in the 19th century, a very strong class system. First thing the British did when they decided to open this mint was appoint a member of the British upper classes to run it. His name was Captain John Francis Campbell. What the Brits would term a bit of a tough. And he was used to the good life in London. His lovely wife used to pop off to Buckingham Palace on occasions to have cups of tea with Queen Victoria. And so you can imagine the look on her dial when he came home and informed her he was taking her to the colonies. And by the way, the most remote one in the British Empire. She wasn't very chuffed, but she came. And she had this magnificent structure as her home. It's rumored that she used to sit up on that balcony up there, eating her cucumber sandwiches and sipping her tea. And she looked across at the best view of the Swan River in the colony until some goose did that. <laughs> but she was pretty miserable here because she tried to go out into the community and make friends with the local ladies and she would invite them back to her stately home. But they refused to come here because in the 19th century, it wasn't considered done for a lady to visit a factory where there were <coughs> factory workers. The other side of the building was the mint, a factory. And so the wife having a problem, the husband's expected to find a solution. And so John set this area up here as a beautiful garden, much better than it is today. And he put in croquet courts, the game that posh ladies play. And every Tuesday afternoon, he would issue an invitation to all the ladies of the colony to come and take tea with his wife between the hours of two and five at the Royal Mint. Now the only way he could get them to come here, at two o'clock he would go into the workshop, went round up all the workmen and march them over to the Grosvenor Hotel. And he made a standard agreement with them. They got three hours in the pub every Tuesday afternoon. As long as they came back and signed on at five, they got paid for the whole day. Now that was a privilege of working in this British Mint that went from 1896 to 1925. During that time, they never had a union. They never had a strike. They just had very happy workers. Do you reckon human resources could whack that in a manual and get something for that? 
I want you to look at the building. Because of John's stature, it had to look like a manor house for a British lord. Perth sits on limestone, and so they got the limestone from Cottesloe Beach, but they had to bring it here by horse and cart. If you look at the blocks very carefully, you'll see they are all different sizes because they were individually chopped up by men with axes to build it up into the air. The light coloured stone going around the archways, that had to be shipped across the ocean from Rottnest Island, down the river on barges, and then from the Barrack Street jetty where the bell tower is, to here by horse and cart. So this very iconic British building took them three years to build. As a comparison, it took three years to build a world-class railway line from Perth to the Goldfields. And that saved thousands of lives. Because those people who landed in Fremantle, in sailing ships, most of them were not experienced prospectors or miners. They were adventurers. They heard about a 16 kilo gold nugget and they jumped on sailing ships. I want you to feel particularly for the British. That nugget was found September 1892. The first lot of British arrived here in the middle of an Australian summer. They thought they were going to pop off the boat and dig for gold. They then found out they had to get a backpack, carry food, water and equipment, walk 600 kilometres into the West Australian desert. Many, many of them dropped down dead with exhaustion and there were typhoid epidemics going right across the gold field. But what kept them coming and coming and coming with these things, gold nuggets. Now this is a copy of the world's biggest gold nugget ever found. Australia's been really fortunate. We've managed to find the 26 largest ones ever found in the world. We're a very nuggety little country. <laughs> this one, I'll talk about in a minute, but just a bit about gold. Gold came to the earth millions of years ago because a star exploded in our galaxy. <clears throat> gold was thrown at the earth. Some of it went so deep that we'll never get it. Some of it got into water systems and came closer to the surface and got trapped between other layers of rocks and so we have to mine for it. Some of it got into rivers, floated around for thousands of years, slowly forming gold nuggets. And so every gold nugget is different. Today, people will pay you a lot more for a nugget than its gold value because people want something that's unique and different. This one was found buried under the ground like that in Victoria. John Gleeson, a Cornish tin miner, came out as a prospector. He found it, but he couldn't get it out the ground. He went and got his mate, Richard Oates, because he had a horse and rope and they pulled it out with the horse and rope. You'd think all their problems were over. They couldn't sell this. Nobody had a gold weighing machine in 1869 that could weigh this. And so unfortunately they took it off to a blacksmith who chopped it up and melted it down. They got 9,000 pounds, $18,000. That's a lot of money in 1869. If you found it today, you'd get about four million for the gold. But how much do you think one of those really rich dudes would pay to hang this around their neck as the world's largest ever nugget? It would be priceless. The gold in this would be half of what it's worth, maybe a tenth of what it's worth. This one is called the Welcome Stranger. 71.5 kilos, found 1869. During the Great Depression of the 30s, 
thousands of Western Australians, like everywhere else, out of work. A lot of them went back to the gold fields because the price of gold was very high during the Depression. People were hoarding gold. 16-year-old Jimmy Larkin found this. And he was throwing it up in the air because he was so excited. But his father came running over abusing him for being a lazy little person, playing with a dead bird, not doing your job. Of course, Dad changed his tune when he realised what it was. And they cut this up, melted it down. They got £6,000, $12,000. And that enabled them to live the Australian dream. They bought a pub, the Golden Eagle Hotel in Boulder. And from that they made their fortune selling beer on the gold fields. The Golden Eagle, 38 kilos, found 1931, Western Australia's largest gold nugget. As a result of the Great Depression, people all over the world were hoarding gold sovereigns. And so, at the end of 1931, Britain had to go off the gold standard, float the pound on the international market. And when they did that, they didn't need this place anymore to produce gold sovereigns. And so they concentrated more on producing very high quality gold bars for the world market. And in 1957, the British produced a gold bar here that was 99.9 nine, nine, nine percent pure gold. Now that was a phenomenal achievement. Today with modern technology, mints only go to 99.99 and they stop. Everybody accepts that as pure gold. But that gave this place a worldwide reputation for quality and so gold bars have been accepted from here all over the world almost without question ever since which makes this a very valuable asset. Now, I'd like all the British people to do me a favour for a minute. I just want you to do that. Anybody that's British. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all Western Australians, because in 1970 you gave this mint to Western Australia. And so this is now a state mint. It's a very valuable asset. And no, you're not getting it back. And so when we became a separate nation in 1901, it wasn't this mint that was responsible for our currency. That was the Commonwealth Government in Canberra. This mint, however, because of its high levels of quality and workmanship, was asked by the British, uh, sorry, by the Australian government to produce some of the coins over the years. And so a lot of Australian coins have had a little change made to them if they came from Perth. And you'll be able to look at those little changes when you go inside. So have a look for that. One of them was that the original sovereigns had a payout. And that just meant extra specially perfect because they came from Perth, and they weren't rubbish from the other side. Well, that's my story anyway. <laughs> now, this is the last nugget. It's called the Hand of Fate. In 1980, Kevin Hillier, a Victorian gentleman, hurt his back at work. And the doctor put him off work for the rest of his life. But he told him to get a lot of exercise. And so Kevin got a metal detector, went over the old Victorian gold fields, trying to supplement his pension with a few old nuggets that had been missed. Came across this very like that. And he took the surface off, pulled it out of the ground. And of course his back was fixed instantly. <laughs> this was worth $400,000 in 1980. You can see how the price of gold goes up over time. Very good investment in the long term. Kevin got a lot more. He realised that this was the 23rd largest nugget ever found in the world. But all the bigger ones had been cut up. This was the largest survivor. And so he auctioned it. He got one million and one dollar from the Golden Nugget Casino in Las Vegas. 
and that's where you have to go and see it today. Now, 27 kilos, it's worth a lot more than that now. We're never getting this back to Australia. Which is a bit unfortunate because we've lost a bit of our heritage. But fortunately, the Australian government learnt their lesson. And in 1995, another gentleman found at Kalgoorlie, the world's second largest survivor, a 25.5 kilo nugget. And before he could sell it overseas, the government passed an act of parliament stopping him. And so it was bought by an Australian mining company and they've graciously decided to leave it here and you'll be able to see it today. It's called the Normandy, it's 25.5 kilo. Now before I take you inside to show you that, a few requests. Number one, can you please make sure that the guards can see your wristband clearly, that it's on your wrist. Uh, also inside, because of security, we can't have any photography. And you've got to make a little bit of decision about yourself. That large doorway that we came out through used to be one big, thick door to symbolise to all the people out here, you're not getting our gold. But Mrs Campbell was very annoyed about that door because she had to walk through the same door as common workmen. And she didn't think that was on. And so John had to fix it by putting in two doors. The one on the right was reserved for ladies and gentlemen of breeding. The door on the left for normal blokes and Charlottes. You decide what you are, let's go inside. Past this point, right?